recently wrote a book, you have the, here on the slides, the art of quantum planning, where you use some of the principles of quantum physics applied to uh, strategy planning. I think that will be the topic of the discussion today. So Jerome, welcome. Well, thank you. Wow. It, it, it must be the time. Huh? <laughs> Listen, thank you all for uh, having me here. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, share my ideas with you. Can you all hear me well? Am I speaking loud enough? Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Uh, what I want to do is uh, give you my view from my experience of what strategic planning is actually all about, right? And so as uh, Beatrice mentioned, I spent 30 years in my career. Um, and I think the seminal part of that uh, was when, uh, when I was with a firm called Global Business Network that does scenario-based planning. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But, but basically, it was a way of thinking about the future in a strategic way. And since you're in, a, I guess, an entrepreneur's program learning how to run a business, you are involved in actually creating the future through your businesses, right? So you are always in the future's business, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all just talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, so my view of what is strategic planning. I think everyone has a definition of what that is, but let me give you mine. Um, thought two things. Uh, strategic planning in my view is actually a thinking process of which you're trying to take ideas and reorganize the real world to produce a result that you want, okay? So if you're not thinking correctly, you're not going to get the greatest results, okay? Uh, it's going from ideas in your brain to organizing assets, financial flows, talent, to accomplish some goals and objectives that you have in mind, okay? Now, you know you're strategic, in my view. A friend, used to me, uh, a friend I worked with said, you know you're strategic when you made a decision that is very difficult to reverse. You have either sunk some assets in the ground, you have hired some people. In essence, that's real strategy. And I, I can tell you, I, I've had experience where I've come into companies, and I've talked to them and said, well, your strategy seems to be this based on these investments. And they'll scratch their head, but no, 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 that's, that's, that's not what we intended. But wait a minute, no, no. So here, here's an example. If you're General Motors and 50% of your sales are SUVs and they get on average 13 miles a gallon, right, that is your strategy, <laughs> whether you like it or not. And if gasoline prices go to 450 a gallon and your sales collapse, that must have been your strategy, right? <laughs> you get my point. You, you cannot really separate your strategy from decisions that you are making in the real world, all right? Now, before I get into the heavy quantum physics, <laughs> I'm not going to do that, by the way, so you all can relax. There will be no <laughs> math uh, questions or anything like that. I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, this process of thinking, and then we'll build into that right into the, to the strategy part. Now. Uh, I, I experienced this this morning. And I will say, if you don't remember anything else, just remember this chart, observation, thought, feelings, actions, and results. So let me walk you through an example of that. When I got up this morning, got in my car, 8.30, heading over here, I get to the Bay Bridge, and traffic is backed up. Ah, observation. <laughs> thought, I might be late. <laughs> <laughs> feeling, panic. Right? Action, ah, I will text Teddy and let him know what is going on, right? My result that I anticipated is that he would relax, he would probably uh, fit something in just in case I was really late, okay? But I went through this process of an observation, thought, feeling, action, and results, okay? We all do that. And very often, this is happening extremely quickly. Now, here's something that you probably have all experienced in this. How many of you ever have done speed dating? Okay. How many of you ever? That's okay. You can admit it. That's okay. How many of you ever gone into a bar to meet someone and picked up a date? 
<laughs> Come on, put your hands up. Come on, all right, right. So you are going through this same process of observation, thought, feeling, taking an action, buying more drink, and getting a result, right? You're doing that. Okay. This is, this, is, this is actually how you live, right? So now let me t attach this to strategy because, in essence, uh, organizations do the same thing. Observation is your market analysis, right? Your thought is your perceptions and ideas about what it is you have perceived out there, right? Your feelings are your actions and interpretations <coughs> of what you've seen, what you thought. The action here is a decision, allocation, resources I was just talking about a few minutes ago. And then the result, okay, that's when your performance management comes in. You are measuring what actions you have taken and what results they are producing in the real world. Okay? So the same thought process that is going on in your head in your natural course of events is mirrored in how your organization is also thinking strategically. They're the same thing. Okay? Now, generally what happens is uh, this goes a lot slower in an organization. <laughs> right? But very often this happens very, very quickly. So here's an example I talked about, uh, I think I was here a couple of weeks ago, and I asked someone, uh, how did Microsoft get into the sort of internet uh, business? When did sort of Windows move to an internet platform? Does anyone know that story, what happened? Well, let me tell you what happened. Bill Gates was doing a speech at Columbia University. It's around 1993, 91, somewhere in there. And he goes on campus. And, and that, at, that, at that time in the world, it was sort of PC and Windows. You're going to control the world. Uh, in fact, all these Apple computers you have on your desk here, they were probably down to like 6% market share, really shrinking, right? But Bill Gates noticed something. A bunch of young kids who looked, looked just like you were all hunched over, very excited about something. And basically what they were doing is using something called Netscape, which you probably <laughs> totally forgotten about, <laughs> to mess around on the internet. And they were really excited about it. And he saw this energy and he says, what is this? And they said, oh, God, it's, it's the future. What are you talking about? So he calls over some of his execs and says, what is this? And they say, oh, Netscape, we don't, what do you mean you don't know what it is, right? So he goes back and turns around the entire organization, right? It begins to weave into the, 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 the Microsoft platform all these internet capabilities that you now take for granted. An observation, a thought, the feeling was, oh my God, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's going on here? He takes action and gets results. Now that's strategy happening like that, okay? Very often it doesn't happen that fast, but believe me, here are your core steps of sort of the underlying thinking process of strategic planning, okay? Now, where, wh 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 what's the problem here? Very often, it's right in these first two, three steps here. It's where most of your errors occur. What happens is this observation, thought, feeling stuff, it, it gets, off, gets off track. Now, this term here, so W-Y-S-A-I-A-T-I -I -I means uh, what you see is all there is. Or what you think is all there is. This is the mistake. You think your observations, your perceptions, are all there is. You're right. Okay? Now, let me just say, there's also some, I'm not going to spend very much time over here, but there's something called the mind-body connection, okay? When you think something, there is a physical thing going on in your body, right? In fact, I mentioned to someone, if you think your mind and body are not connected, decide to cut off your arm and see that as your mind <laughs> respond, okay? They're connected. So this whole observation, thought, feeling thing has an emotional context to it. All strategy has an emotional context. 
Now let me give you another bad example. Okay. How many of you have heard of a firm called Lehman Brothers? What happened to them? They what? The money tell me, what happened? Overexposed themselves. And they what? <laughs> Subsequent what went what? Bankrupt. Right. They're out of business. Now, what was the story there? Well, let me give you a little bit of background on that story. Okay. The CEO of Lehman Brothers had an elevator in the back of the building in which he could enter the building without talking to any of the people that worked with him. He would be limoed in, come up his private elevator, and not interact with anybody. The whole strategy of the firm was explained to three people. Now, what is the emotional context of a person who has thousands of people working for him, but he doesn't want to engage them? Right? So here was his decision. He felt that the collapse in the real estate market was a temporary state of affairs, and that within a year or so it would come back. So what did he do? He doubled down his bet. <laughs> and not only that, he financed the whole thing with overnight funds, which is made like on a credit card. So imagine you're financing your firm on $150 billion every night you have to turn over. And all of a sudden, your process of observation and thought is garbage. That's how you tank a company overnight. Thought led to feelings, led to actions, led to results. Okay. So as you are putting together, I think you've been putting together business plans and analysis. I didn't get a chance to see some of it this morning. You may want to also think about what is the feeling space behind some of the decisions that you're making. Because that may be the place that you trip up. You may have an emotional attachment to an idea. So let, let me give you some examples of where you can easily trip up. Here. Okay. Uh, the, the past is, is prescient, right? This is, in, in essence, the Lehman Brothers case. Because they had done this, this sort of doubling down trick early on and made a lot of money. This time they were wrong. Uh, uh, misprojecting the meaning of something. <coughs> okay? Fortunately, Bill Gates' example, he correctly understood the meaning of something. Right? But very often, people miss it. Right? Uh, attachment to a comfort zone. You know, I, I like the way this, uh, this works. Okay? Um, now let me give you some more specific examples here. The Lehman Brothers I talked about. Uh, what happened to Merrill Lynch? Does anyone know what happened to them? Do they exist anymore? Where are they? Bank of America. They are what now? Bank of America. They are part of Bank of America, right? And what happened to them? They were what? sold <laughs> on a weekend in 2009 at the height of the crisis, right? An uh, uh, almost 100-year-old firm. Well, the background was on that issue was they were trying to copy Lehman's strategy. <laughs> okay? Misprojecting the meaning of what was going on. Okay. Uh, General Motors, I've talked about. Okay. Uh, SUVs will sell forever. I mean, for 10 years, they were the highest margin product that General Motors sold. On that big Chevy sub Suburban, there was a $14,000 direct drop to the bottom line on every vehicle sold. Okay. Now this is one of my favorite ones. Michelle Obama's uh, roommate at Princeton, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> imagine if your friend was now the first lady of the United States, right? But you know, she understood it. Called her mother and says, "Oh my God, there's a black girl in my room." I need another roommate. Okay. 
uh, discomfort with the unknown. This happens a lot. But I, I have to give your generation a lot more credit than mine, you know. I think the whole diversity, globalization, understanding the broader world, your comfort level is a lot higher. So I would expect to see a few of these mistakes. Uh, does anyone know that AT&T was actually offered the internet by the U.S. government? Oh my God. The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> they said, ah, no. <laughs> we don't make any money. What is that? We don't make any money out of that. Okay. The unknown unknown, right? You, you don't quite understand what that is. I'm going to talk about Apple computer near the end, but uh, uh, the, the example I want to put off of Apple is when they, when they launched the original iPhone and they had apps on there, right? They didn't anticipate that individual people <laughs> outside the company would make apps. But almost as soon as they hit the market, people were doing this, right? So what did Apple do? They started an apps business, right? They opened that thing up. Right? Even though they had no previous experience with that. Right? And I think down the line, when Steve Jobs, at least in the last 10 years, his fundamental philosophy to me seemed to be one of openness, not being closed. And I think that helped him sort of manage through these unknown unknowns that were emerging in the marketplace. Okay? So now, we'll move a little bit into sort of the uh, the quantum aspects. So here's this question I have for you. Do you observe your own thoughts? How do you do that? Okay. Now, what is, someone give me an example of what I call re reflective thinking. What is that? Give me an example of reflective thinking. Anyone? Asking why, like, what triggered that thinking? Mm -hmm. Why? What are the implications? Yeah. Who are affected? Yeah. In what state of mind am I in to think that way? Exactly. So. I particularly like that last one. In what state of mind am I in to think that way? Is that what you said? Yeah. Right. Remember, poor thinking leads to poor results. So, now how do I get to this sort of uh, idea about quantum physics. Well, here's what was going on. I was running a large scenario project for the electric power industry. And we were looking at um, technology evolution in the industry. And we had at least 15 CEOs in the room, 10 executive vice presidents, you know. All of us are wearing ties, you know. <laughs> and uh, we worked with these people for about six months. Great set of scenarios. But they were boring, right? I mean, I probably could have written these scenarios for them like two weeks into the project, right? And I said, OK. Just as this was going on, I go to the theater, and I see this movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? <laughs> who, who has seen this film? OK. Give me, give me an impression of this film that you have from watching. It's, I mean, it's overwhelming, to be honest with you. Someone in the back, I think, had a hand. What was your perception of this film? Um, Said it again? Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Here's what I found was so fascinating about the film. Okay. These were some of the leading physicists and thinkers and scientists, you know, of our time, who were saying things that were, in my mind. <laughs> Some of the craziest things I've ever heard. So here's one that really caught me off guard, right? There was a guy on there, down at Stanford, who says that he would get up in the morning, right, and he would sort of like imagine his day a little bit, but then he would look for these small signals, <laughs> right, of what might happen, and he would just sort of move toward them in a way. I thought, wow, this guy's a physicist saying this? What is he talking about? <laughs> right? Now, 
I think the kind of way he got to this point was physicists now understand is that the point from which you are observing something actually impacts what's there. Let me say that again. The point from which you are observing something impacts what's there. It's a classic experiment with light where the light is a particle and a wave. It has the properties of both. Right? But it's either one or the other depending on how you are observing it. I thought, wow, I mean, I'm trying to get my head around that, right? But I'm thinking, wait a minute, how do I get that kind of thought, that kind of shake it up kind of ideas into this future thinking that I'm doing? How do I do that? So that's when I ask myself, wait, wait a minute, how do I assess the quality of my thoughts? And what I, what I came up with is, let me pull some of these principles out here, right? and see if they can help me open up my mind to a different way of thinking when I'm in the middle of something. So, a little bit more about the physics. It is about the real world. And remember I said strategy is about going from thoughts to things. You are taking your thoughts to try to change something in the real world, right? Apple Computer is a real world company. General Motors is a real, they make real products, right? All of the ideas that you're talking about here, whether it's a, a new internet site or a new service or whatever, you want to impact the real world, correct? So in my view, why don't we try to figure out how the real world <laughs> works as a tool for helping me think more clearly. Okay? We've done this throughout human history, by the way. Most of our language, okay, uh, is about real world experience. So if I say to you, I'm getting over the hump, you, you understand what I mean by that, right? Because you have the physical experience of overcoming something. Right, so our language is like this, right? So, let me go back to this. Remember that this is the core of the thinking process in your strategic planning. This place over here, going from your observation down to the results. Here what you want to do is find a way to have alternative perspectives about what's going on. So let me go back to General Motors. Suppose you're at General Motors and some guy comes in when you just made like $5 billion in profits off of SUVs and says, hey, you know what? I think the price of gasoline may go up to like you know, four seventy-five a gallon and sales might tank. Uh, you, you think you might want to have some uh, products for that, you know, maybe? Right? <laughs> uh, and, and someone says, well, maybe, you know, okay, whatever. So, you know, at least you then begin to think about producing the now electric vehicle that they have on the marketplace, you know, several years late, right? But what I want to say is this whole scenario thinking process, think of it as, as um, a way of checking your assumptions about what you think may unfold. Okay, and actually using your assumptions and your ideas to create multiple ways in which things may play out. Because here's where the strategy comes in. Once you have, for example, in this GM case, two different worlds, you can then strategize on how I might survive, what I might do, what products and services I may create in those alternative worlds. So let me give you a little bit more detail on that. So here are the core steps of this process, okay? One of the first things you want to do when you're thinking about the future, and as you're working on your projects, right, and you're thinking about the future, the markets you're going to go in, the customers, the products, right, really get clear on at least one or several questions you're asking about the future. Now, the reason you want to do that is because 
as you're creating these alternative worlds, that's going to anchor you. When you come back to, to talk to your, 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 your uh, team, you want to know, oh, yeah, here's a question we're trying to answer. Okay. So I'll give you an example. If I go back to the electric power industry one that we were looking at, the whole question there was, what investments in alternative technology should the industry make? Ah, should we go into nuclear? Should we go into more solar, wind, natural gas, whatever it is? That was the core question, right? And you may have core questions in your business, right? Now, what are all the factors that might influence that? And this is all this open brainstorming that you might do. So you may say, well, it may be something in financial markets. It may be something in uh, cultural change. It may be a shift in values. It may be technological shifts. It may be shifts in the financial markets. I mean, you're really emptying your head. You're opening up to how does this, this the, the, what is the context of the environment that you're playing in? How does it work? Okay. You find some organizing tool, and there's some examples on my website. I just think we, we kind of got this. But you get some kind of structure. We like to use a, a matrix, but you get some way of sort of boiling all that down. And, and the way we do it is to find out if there are two really, really important factors that are driving what you're uncertain about. Okay. So for example, when we did the, uh, the, the work in the power industry, it was the rate of technological innovation how fast or slow is it going to be, right? And then, what was the integration of this stuff into the marketplace? Fast, slow, open, close, where was it going to go, right? So we had either fast tech, open markets, or some really slow tech and closed markets. See what I'm saying? Because all of a sudden, we had very different ways the future may pan out, okay? You create some stories some logic, some arguments, right? You may use some modeling. For example, if you have a financial model, you may want to change some of the assumptions in your financial model based on the different alternative futures that you have. So for example, if I was General Motors, going back to that example, I would say, wait a minute, suppose we pull us out a billion dollars in R&D, and we're going to focus that on you know, clean fuel vehicles, that's going to shift our projections from, you know, uh, making more SUVs, right? So you, you model this. You get some, some sense of what the impacts are. Then you finalize those, put some potential strategies in there, test those, right? And then here's the last part that's important to me. You figure out as you go through this process, what do I need to learn more about as I was doing this thinking? Right? What is my learning agenda going forward? So what I'm saying is you never close the door on your strategic thinking. It always has to have this open aspect to it, a learning aspect to it. In fact, I call it learning your way forward. Okay? So even once you played this game, you know, always have sort of a little bucket list somewhere that says, you know, as we were thinking about that, here's what we didn't know. Here's what we may research further. Here's a market segment that we saw over there that didn't look tempting right now, but it may emerge. Here was a technology over here that's maybe not mature, but maybe it's going to come in. Can you imagine Steve Jobs doing this at Apple? Right? I mean, how many times did he come after the iPad? Do you know? At least three times. You remember the first effort at a kind of tablet device that they did and collapsed in the market, right? Okay, so here are these, these core steps there. And again, what this is allowing me to do is to come up with some alternative ways of seeing how the future may plan out. So this thought process, process that you're going through is open, right? Now, I'm going to talk about sort of this side over here. Remember I said it's about the real world, right? So the question is, when you go out and experience the real world and you get some feedback from your results, how do you process that, right? You're Steve Jobs. 
You put your first tablet with a little pen thing out there in the marketplace, and nobody buys any. Not good, right? Okay. What did he do with that? He didn't give up, right? Saved some of the technology, got a skunk work team over here, right? In fact, what I think messes up a lot of strategic thinking is when you have a what quote unquote failure, <coughs> how do you understand that? Even in your personal life, when you have a failure, do you learn from it? Do you beat yourself up, <laughs> right? Or do you say, oh, okay, hmm, that means I need to change something. I need to grow somewhere, right? I need an alternative approach. It's this processing of this thinking here, right? So I'm going to end with just a few of these sort of uh, quantum ideas. Again, think of these as, okay, I need to check the quality of my own. I need to figure out what am I really thinking. Is this good or not, right? How do I test that out, right? So here's, here's one of the core concepts. And I mentioned it. Light has the properties of both a particle and a wave. In fact, what we're understanding now is that the photosynthesis process in plants, plants are absorbing light in both ways. And it does this instantaneously depending on the intelligence that's in the plant. Right? What this says to me is that at its core, it's not about one or the other. It's about the integration of them. It's about them in balance. Right? So when you're working in your groups, and it's one group against the other, or, you know, I'm right and you're wrong, left and right, red states versus blue states, whatever you want to call it, right? What we know is somewhere in the middle, there's some truth that it integrates the two, right? And so I want you to hold that as a way of sort of testing uh, uh, some of your thinking, right? Go back to the Apple uh, example here, okay? Um, you know, early on in Apple's, uh, uh, you know, growth, it was really Mac versus PC. It was very dual, right? Uh, the Windows operating system against the better, easier, faster, that I like better, <laughs> uh, Mac operating system, right? And that's the way they saw the world, right? But interestingly, Apple changed its name from what? Apple Computer to what? Okay. Apple Corporation. That, to me, was critical. Because all of a sudden, it's not just about me against Bill Gates, right? And now Apple is what? The highest valued company on the planet worth $600 plus billion. Because they now have multiple, in fact, you probably don't even think of Apple. Your, your first thought is probably even not a, not, a, not, a, not a Mac, right? It's all their other products, right? So what I see them doing is releasing themselves <coughs> from this duality in their thinking, OK? Uh, this is one of my favorite ones right here. Uh, you cannot simultaneously know both the speed and the position of an electron because the very process of measuring one influences the other. Now think about that. That can happen to you in your life, right? So here, here's an example, right? Um, I have a son who's 24 years old, uh, he's in college, and uh, he brings his girlfriend home, you know, for the holidays. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, wow, I mean, what should I say, right? If I say, oh, I think she's wonderful, <laughs> then he's going to say, oh, dad, you know, I mean, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to influence what I'm doing here, right? If, if I don't say anything, then the young lady might feel a little pull back, right, you know. So I'm trying to figure out, like, well, how do I do both of these things 
you know, how do I influence them both, right? And I realized I can't do both of these things. So there was some inherent uncertainty in my mind, right? Very often, you're going to be in a situation where if you do one thing, if I say something nice about this girl, <laughs> right, I'm going to influence another that I'm not trying to control, right? So that's the core of this. So it is impossible to get all of the information to make the exact right decision all the time. It's impossible to do it because things are changing. You live in, someone said, uh, you know, this is an organic world and we're trying to use inorganic tools to manage it. Same principle, okay? Um, this is this, tip, this point about observation. And uh, let me ask you this. Uh, what time is it? What time do you have? What time is it? It's about, uh, okay. Uh, do you really think that's what time it is? Or is that something we constructed? We constructed. Right. Because I was, if I was in Australia, it would be a different time, right? If I was on the moon, right? Okay. The whole point I'm making here is that we are setting things up pretty much based on the point from which we are observing it, right? So when you're putting together your business plans, understand everything that you're doing is from your particular <coughs> point of, of observation, which means you can diversify that by maybe having a potential customer look at what you're thinking. Maybe a potential competitor look at what you're thinking, right? Maybe someone who's been in that market and failed at what you're thinking, right? My whole point here is multiple points of observation see different things, right? How many of you know that the old story about if, you ever, if three people see a car accident, they never, no one else saw the same thing, right? Because it depends on the point of which you are observing it, right? This last one, um, how many of you have you ever heard of this term, all to all strategy? W what does that mean? What do you think that means? Let me give you some examples, okay? Oh, sit one. Oh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, how does eBay work? <coughs> anybody can sell anything on eBay to anybody. Right? All to all. Right? To me, it's also kind of a, it, it, it's kind of an energy company because depending on what's going on in the marketplace, for example, like a month ago, all of a sudden, I can get like an iPad used or the last generation of it for things like, like $3.99 or something, right? $2.99, right? To me, eBay has its pulse on what's going on in the economy because at any given point, I can go on there and like find out what's for sale, what's cheap, what's hot, what's not, right? Okay. Uh, what is Facebook? What aspects of Facebook are all to all in your view? Connecting with everyone. Right. I mean, I could be friends with what? Just about everybody on Facebook if I took the time. <laughs> right? So what I think is emerging, when I go back to this everything is energy, is that strategies are now beginning to understand that, wait a minute, just like the universe is one interconnected energy system. Maybe the world we live in is one interconnected energy system. And we just need to figure out a way to take advantage of that. <coughs> and one of the ways to do that is to interconnect everything with everything. Right? Uh, how many of you have heard this term, big data? Okay, wh wh what is big data? Big data is that we have all this ability to collect data from everything we're doing from the individual level to bigger levels, and there's so much data out there that we can hardly understand. We're choking on it, right? Yeah. But do you see the all-to-all -all aspects 
How's that? <laughs> right? It's like all of a sudden, I'm going to have this little device here, and if I wanted to turn down the thermostat at my house from here, you know, I could do it. If I wanted to signal to my bank to move some money from one account to the other, you know, I could do it, right? Uh, or what's going on now a lot is, uh, you know, there's a camera on the street, <laughs> so that if you happen to run the light, <laughs> we'll just take a picture of your license plate and mail you the ticket, <laughs> right? Or someone commits a crime. Have you noticed this right now? What happened? They grab all the video cameras from around the crime scene, right? Mm -hmm. And they look at it. You guys are coming into this world where what's happening is machines, not people, are constantly recording information and data, right? So the big question is going to be <coughs> is how do you turn this into products, how do you turn this into services? It goes back to my point of everything is energy. Now think when you're doing your strategy, if this is the thought that's in your head, how do I structure my company to take advantage of an all-to-all -all aspect in my business? Does that open up your mind to maybe thinking of it in a different way? Right? It can be, but remember I said what? Learn your way forward, right? You have a result, you process that result, right? You reobserve, right? You don't get overwhelmed by it. You get in a learning loop. So here's my uh, death by PowerPoint slide. <laughs> okay. That basically kind of lays this out. So here's what I'm suggesting you do. You guys are probably right in this section here. You know, you got your plans, you got your ideas, you looking at your organization, you know, your, how much money you're gonna need, how much you think you're gonna make, right? What's your service and product, right? So you're in this loop right in here, right? Okay? The only thing I'm suggesting is to add this other loop, right? You can do all your scenario work down in here, right? But when you, in the strategic point, this creative thinking part comes in and, wait a minute, okay. In fact, there was, a, there was an article about um, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, right? About every three or four months, you know what he does? He takes a couple of days off, and he does a personal retreat, and he just sits back, and he reads stuff, he goes around on the internet, he talks to people, right? He invigorates his creative thinking. Then he comes back to his organization when he says some of these ideas are good, some of them are bad, right? What he's doing is he is checking his own thoughts, right? So what I'm suggesting is as you're doing that, maybe there's a few tools. Ah, am I stuck in duality? Oh, wow. Do I understand that everything might be connected to everything, right? Tools for your thinking.